Okay, Maestro, hit it! Yay! I'm Wally Boat. I didn't know you knew Mickey Mouse. Museum of the Weird. The dawn of a new era. Just a dream away. Welcome to the Disney Record Guy YouTube channel. We are in the kitchen today, which is like a very odd place to be if you watch anything on our YouTube channel. But I even had to bring in my fiance for this. This is Taylor Olmsted. Everybody say hi. Taylor, say hi. Hello. So, um, I, I could not cook a meal without Taylor. Taylor cooks all of the food around the house. I do the dishes. We make it work. It's a work in progress. But the reason we are joined in the kitchen is it's not just us in the kitchen. We are joined today by an amazing chef. First off, not just an amazing chef, she is also a renowned former uh, trapeze performer, a skill that would land her the job as one of Walt Disney World's first ever flying Tinkerbells. I am delighted to introduce you all to Mara Cristiani, also known as the Aerialist Chef. Mara, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're great. We're very Good. excited to be cooking a Tinkerbell uh, meal. In fact, we also have once we get this done, we're very excited to be topping it off with a little Tinkerbell cake topper. Oh, show yes. off. I don't have anything so, that nice. Oh, well, it's the finest cake topper that the Walmart 99 cent aisle can buy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a little bit odd today. We're going to not only be cooking a meal with Mara, we are going to be also diving into her history as one of Walt Disney World's first ever flying Tinkerbell performers. So we're going to be making a cake. And we are going to not only do that, we're going to look back on all this amazing history. We're very excited to do it today. Um, Mara, let's get started with the obvious. What are we making today? Well, we're going to make a key lime coconut angel food cake. And it's so hot. We're in Florida. It's really hot down here. I don't know about where you are. And I don't want to turn on the oven, but I still have to have my cake. So we're going to make everything here you can get at the store. You don't have to turn on your oven and nobody will know because it's delicious. That is something I'm very excited about because if there's anything I know, it is I do not belong in an oven. Taylor can attest to this. Um, so it's anything that I can do that's quick and easy is absolutely that's the recipe for me. Um, obviously, the biggest question is how do you go from trapeze artist to gourmet YouTube chef? Well, you know, I always like to cook and bake like a lot of people. It's a hobby. And then because I'm so maniacal and a perfectionist, no matter what I do, I have to be the best at it or, you know, try to be. So that's why I don't play basketball. You know, like I know I'm never going to dunk the ball. So I love basketball, but I'm never going to play it. But I was actually really good at cooking and baking. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to start doing that. Every time I had free time, I'd be traveling the world just like you. And I would eat at a restaurant and say, oh, my goodness, that's really good. And if they didn't share the recipe, I would find a way to make it myself. And then I just practice and practice and I got really good at it. So I actually turned it into a second career when I retired from Tinkerbell and trapeze work and dancing and choreography. I became a professional pastry chef. I mean, not not to just undercut what that resume was that you just said from Tinkerbell, professional dancing. And you're still um, teaching trapeze in Sarasota, correct? Yes, actually, I retired from my professional chef career last year, and now I'm teaching full-time. I coach at the uh, Circus Arts Conservatory in Sarasota, Florida, which is the oldest circus school, uh, school in the world, and it's really amazing. I just love working with the kids. We work with kids from the very beginning until professional level, actually, so it's very rewarding. That's awesome. That is super neat. Um, so Mara, what is the very first step for us today on this cake? Okay, so the first thing you want to do is you buy our store-bought or you can make your own. I have to say when I make my own, it's like twice the size, <laughs> but <laughs> it's okay. So you're going to use a serrated knife and that's the knife with the little teeth. Now, if you don't have that, you can use a regular knife, but this is also called a bread knife. And you see it's a fairly long blade so that it will go across the length of the cake. That makes it easier. It's not mandatory, it just makes it easier for you. And 
when you're cutting, you always want to make sure that you're not cutting toward your hand. Your hand should be on top. You place your blade. We're going to cut two times so that we have three layers of cake all together. So the first thing is the top. And you'll see where I'm going to put it right there. And I'm going to go through it. And I'm not going to cut all the way through the first time around. You see, I'm using one hand to turn. And I have this nice cake stand. If you don't have it, some people have like a turntable that your spices sit on. Uh, you can use that or you can just use a plate and turn it with your, your hand. So I'm going around a little bit. Like I said, I'm not going all the way through this time. And then as soon as I get back where I started, I'll go ahead and finish by cutting all the way through. So there's our top. And I'll take that and I'm going to put it top side down on a plate and set it aside. How you doing, Taylor? I'm doing okay. I'm using a little utility knife, so it took me a little bit longer. You mean a carpet cutter? <laughs> <laughs> but I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. So set that aside, upside down, and now put can your you hand back plate? on top, <laughs> and you're going to continue cutting one more so you can cut in the middle of the last remaining cake. Again, score it a little bit as you turn. Don't cut all the way through. And don't worry, it's messy. So you get to eat all the scraps. That's the best part. <laughs> I'm very supportive of that. Very Keep cutting. That. And then when you get where you started, then you're going to go ahead and let the knife go. So you see how much easier it is with a large knife? Oh, yeah. Quick work of it. Yeah. And then I you got there really place and you let me know when you're there. Got it. Okay. Okay, leave it there. Put it back. And now with your finger, and this is the most fun part of the entire recipe. With your finger, you're gonna make a little trough in the middle. Don't score the sides, you're just gonna pull a little bit of cake and we're making a moat for all that yummy filling because I want more filling. So you set that aside. And I always joke that I never have trouble finding volunteers for this step. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Everybody wants to do this step. This is nice, this leftover, you can crumble it over ice cream if you if it makes it that far. Well, that's very smart. Who I do very strongly support that. Okay. So you see how I'm leaving the sides intact and I'm just scoring the middle moat. Yes, pretty deep too, right? Right. I mean, it's like okay. Tinkerbell's castle if you had a moat around it, you see? <laughs> okay. Okay. And once that's done, then we're going to take that layer and turn it upside down on the top piece and do the same thing, make a moat in the bottom layer. Oh. Oh, oh, we are going we had a casualty. Our middle layer came apart a little, but that's okay. okay. That doesn't matter. If it breaks in half, it won't matter. You're going to be able to squish it back together. Okay. And then we're doing the same thing in the bottom piece? Same thing in the bottom. You're going to make a trough. Just a little, don't go too okay. deep. If you go okay. too deep, it will fall apart. But that's okay, because once you put the filling, it's going to stick it all together. So while we are making this trough, um, can you tell us, how did you get started with the trapeze? Well, I was a dancer and acrobat, and I married into a very, very famous circus family. One of the oldest, it's actually the Christiani family is considered circus royalty. Introducing three members of the famous Christiani family, the world's greatest riding act. They're Italian and don't understand English very well, but boy, can they do acrobatics on galloping horses. Well, so much for the build-up, boys. Now let's see you do something on a horse. And now, there are four. Five. And here comes the sixth. Everybody rides. Alley. That's seven. And here comes the eighth. So when I got in the family and they all specialized, my husband and his brother were one of the, some of the best trampolinists in the world. His father is the best bareback rider in the world in the history of circus. So, and they all did different things. His mother did a beautiful uncaged leopard act. And so I get into this incredible family and I figure I, I want to do something different, you know, myself. And even though I was a very good acrobat, so I went right away into the trampoline act and I could do that. 
And I said, I want to do something. When I uh, had my first son, Mateo, um, I wanted to get back in shape. And we were on Disney on Ice. And a man named Gerard Sewells had done this trapeze act that I'm doing. And he was working there and he was going to teach me the pretty girl trapeze where you get on there and do splits and look pretty. But then he realized how strong I was and how fearless I was and, well, how crazy I was. And he <laughs> said, you know what? I think you would be great at learning my act. Do you want to do it? And I'm like, of course. And so he taught me his trapeze act, which is incredible, a gift from him, to, if you think about it. But only five people in the history of circus did this particular act which is all heel catching. There was like three men and two other women in the history of circus that did this act. So I'm very honored to be one of them, actually. Okay, so let's set our cake aside. And okay. In our bowl, we have a can of sweetened condensed milk, which is one of the greatest inventions of mankind, and an eight ounce thing of cream cheese that I left out overnight at room temperature to soft. But if you didn't, it doesn't matter. We did not, I don't think. And we're going to not use a blender and I'm using a handheld one. You can use a stand blender. If you don't have that, you can use a wooden spoon and just, it's gonna take a lot of muscle. <laughs> oh, we don't have that in this house. So we will also be using a hand blender. <laughs> and how much cream cheese did you say? It's eight ounces, it's an eight ounce. An eight ounce block. So can you grab that for me just now? Yeah. For your viewers, don't try to memorize this. You can go to my YouTube channel and I have this exact recipe and I have a whole um, YouTube show on it. So it'll have the recipe, the instructions, so you don't need to memorize it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. And you wanna start low, Taylor, so that you're not wearing it. Now, would you recommend a whisk attachment or beaters for this? Use your beaters. Got it. Because the cream cheese is going to be a little rough on your, your whisk attachment. It's always best when you're making anything with cream cheese, whether it's a frosting or a cheesecake, is to have room temperature cream cheese. And the reason for that is that you want it to be completely smooth with no lumps before you move on to the next step. The sweet condensed milk will also help smooth out that cream cheese. So I don't know if you know or not, Joseph, but my daughter-in-law, Gina, is a world champion juggler as well. And so when I retired, uh, she entered me into the Food Network show Chopped because we used to sit down warming up together when we were on tour together. And she would always tell me what was in the basket. And she'd say, Mara, what would you make if you got blah, blah, blah? So I would always come up with some crazy dish that I would make because it was easy to say, I want to make this if I didn't actually have to do it. And so when I retired, she entered me, she filled out the form and entered me in, you know, to become, uh, to compete in CHOP. And I didn't know anything about it, but I get a phone call while I'm working as a pastry chef that says, hi, this is Food Network, and would you be interested in, and I thought somebody was playing a joke on me because my family does stuff like that. So I'm like, oh yeah, ha, 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 sure you are, you're from CHOP, uh. And he goes, no man, I'm like, really, I am. There's a producer going to be calling you, and if you're interested, um, I suggest you, you talk to him. So I thought, oh gosh. And he did. He called me and asked me if I would be interested in competing. And I, he said, we want to do a special thing for mother, uh, Mother's Day where mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws compete either against each other or together. So anyway, Gina and I ended up competing together as a team. Mara and Gina, Kathy and Danielle, which team is going to conquer the other? I think we have a huge advantage in the dessert realm because that's what we do. I know Mara and Gina have a cake business, but I'm here to compete. Please open your baskets. And your desserts must include monkey bread, feoa. I have never heard of feoa in my life. Cream cheese and orange blossom water. 30 minutes on the countdown clock. And we're starting it now. And we won. That's amazing. That was really cool. We won Chopped together. And that means, Mara and Gina Cristiani, that you are the Chopped champions. And while you do have to split the prize, it's still not a terrible payday. 10,000 bucks. Congratulations. <laughs> Did he say split? Oh my God, see? Winning Chopped is just an enormous accomplishment for us. 
I'm sure she wanted to strangle me a couple times. We did show that in the end, we can pull together and win. All right, Taylor, do you have a nice, smooth? I think so. Here, okay, let me scoop some out for you. Oh, that's perfect. That looks pretty that's good. Perfect. Awesome. All right, now take your uh, eight ounces of Cool Whip and dump that in there. And you're just going to fold it in. And what I mean by folding in is you're going to go around and through the middle and turn your spatula over. So use one hand to turn the bowl and the other hand goes around through the middle and over. Now, because this is a commercial uh, product, Cool Whip, it's emulsified, it has stabilizers, so you're not going to deflate it like you would if you were using fresh whipped cream. So you can be a little bit rougher with it. How you doing, I'm gonna step aside for just a moment while he does that. Our Bebo has realized that we are cooking food and is very eagerly wanting to be a part of the process. Oh, so he's so cute. We are gonna take him off to the side for just a moment. I'm gonna have Taylor mix in that while I step aside and take care of Mr. Sherlock. <laughs> Okay, so we folded together our icing mix here. And then you're going to add your fresh zested lime and lime juice. All right. And you see, if you prep this, you can even prep this stuff the day before. If you do, make sure that you put your lime zest right in the juice, and that will keep that zest uh, fresh, okay? It won't dry out on you. And so we you have the zest of one lime. Before. Yeah, you want to stir it all together. Be careful because it'll get kind of soupy before that acid in the lime juice will start to thicken it. This We're actually is gonna... also a great way of making um, no-bake cheesecake. It's the same principle. You put an acid like lemon juice or lime juice, add cream cheese. You can add Cool Whip, and there's your homemade no-bake cheesecake. That is awesome. I'm actually going to take a break here to juice a lime. Um, you said just the juice of one lime? Uh, it's a one-third cup. That's going to take about three to four limes. If you don't yeah, have a lucky juicer at home, you can cut a lime in half, stick a fork in it, and turn it back and forth. It does the same thing. All right. So we have the juice of about four limes here. There you go. Pour that right in. All righty. And the zest, and then just fold it all together. You're going to stir it. It's going to look soupy at first. And then that acid from the lime juice is going to pull it all together and it's going to thicken. And it's going to make a perfect filling. So while Taylor is doing that, I want to get into obviously the big question on everybody's mind. Um, how did you end up becoming one of Walt Disney World's first flying Tinkerbells? Well, I was working at Circus World at the time, which turned into baseball and boardwalk. And now it's a, an outlet mall. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ringling owned it originally or put the, not, not the park, but they brought the entertainment there, the Feld Corporation. And then they stepped back and then another company, they just started hiring performers and we were hired to come work there. So I did my trapeze act and we did our family trampoline act there. And they were looking for um, a stunt woman or an aerialist, somebody that was crazy enough to jump out of the castle, obviously. <laughs> and so one of the girls, Michelle Smith, was working there in the flying act. Her uh, boyfriend at the time was a catcher. And so I think she knew some people there uh, at Disney. Maybe she had danced there as a kid. I'm not sure. And so she was hired. And she either mentioned me. I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, one of them had come to see me work at, at, at Circus World and, and saw the trapeze act and thought, wow, okay, she's perfect for Tinkerbell. And so Bill Sullivan at the time, um, he was the head of operations, I think, at Disney World at the time. And somebody came and told him, I saw this woman at Circus World doing trapeze. She's our perfect Tinkerbell. And so they called me and I came in and they hired me and Michelle Smith at the same time to do Tinkerbell. So what was, what, obviously this is the first time that they're doing this at um, Walt Disney World. What was the training process like? For the two of you because this i mean it's a you're you right you're like setting the foundation the first thing to do is they had to stabilize the tier of the castle for the tension of that huge cable so they came in and i believe i'm sure bill sullivan would know better than me but it was like 28 to thirty thousand dollars 
to uh, stabilize the tiers to make them strong enough for the cable to uh, be pulled, the tension that it was going to take to pull it. Because you know, you go from the window out of the castle and it goes all the way to the roof of Tomorrowland. So it's quite a long distance. Mm -hmm. And so the tension on the cable is a lot. So they first had to do that. And then they decided that they were going to have a first ever braking system. So we wore a harness, sort of like a mountain climbing harness. And on that harness that was attached to a cable was this braking system. So what it was is it would use your uh, body based on your body weight, the distance uh, of that you're going to travel. So you would start and go fairly quickly, and then it was going to slow down as you approached the building. That was how it was supposed to work, but they weren't sure. So they said, okay, we're going to, they got one of those giant construction cranes and to test the harness. You know, those ones you see like in New York City, those huge cranes. And they brought that in and they put the harness on us and they looked at both of us and said, who wants to do it? And Michelle was a little apprehensive. And I'm like, yeah, I do, I do, I do. <laughs> and so immediately they hooked me up and they pulled me up on this giant crane and I started doing the little Tinkerbell movements, you know. And Bill Sullivan looked at my husband, he's like, is she like this all the time? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, actually she is. So it was actually a blast. I didn't want to come down. It was so fun. And then Michelle went up after she saw that I wasn't, you know, I survived. And she went oh, up and yeah, we both said, wow, that is so much fun. And then, of course, we had to go to the actual castle and do it on the cable. And so, again, they're like, you know, anybody want to go? And I'm like, yeah, heck, I'll go first. <laughs> so I, I went in there and, you know, I said, you know, just tell me when. And what they did is you would step your feet out of the window and they had a little rope around your cable that was hooked to the cable so that when they released it, you go. So they're like, are you ready? I'm like, yes, go. But what <laughs> they didn't know is that, as I told you, about a month before that, I had fallen from the trapeze and broken all my ribs on one side. And I was just starting to work again, but it was actually very soft and sensitive, as you can imagine. Oh, I'm sure. But I didn't tell them that. I I didn't let them know that I was injured, you know. So I went out and the braking system didn't work. It actually sped up. So oh, wow. I'm halfway down and I realized uh, it's not slowing down. It's <laughs> faster. So I'm probably about 20 feet away from Tomorrowland and they have these two huge linebacker looking guys that held something that looked like a giant sail on either side that was supposed to kind of catch you in the middle of it and ride you down. And the last resort was the end of the roof of Tomorrowland. They had it look like a goal post in football with a, a mat wrapped around it. That was the last resort. So I'm 20 feet out and I realized I'm really going fast. And the only way that I, it, the, the system allowed you to turn was this way, which is where my broken ribs were. Oh, so I scream at the guys, I'm coming in fast. <laughs> and they grabbed, I hit that sail, take both those guys. And at those times, I barely weighed like 110 pounds. These guys were big. I took them off their feet. So all three of us are flying. Their feet are off the floor. I'm in the middle. And now my, the wind's knocked out of me because my broken ribs are like, ah. When we slide all the way and we hit that last beam, the goalpost, they fall down on the floor and they immediately are, oh my God, she's not breathing. Cause I was like, because <laughs> the oh, wind huh. knocked out of me because oh. my ribs were, were so soft at that time. And I was fine, but I guess they thought I was dead or something. Like, oh my God, she's not breathing. I'd be terrified too. <laughs> yeah, they were terrified. But after I'm like, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I never did tell them my ribs were broken. Never, the whole time there, I never told them. But then it was fine. I'm like, okay, let's do it again. <laughs> that's crazy. You're doing that night after night after night with broken ribs. And I mean, that's just totally crazy. It's, it's so hard for me to fathom. Just, I mean, obviously that height to anyone who's not a trapeze performer is going to be astonishing and kind of terrifying to do. And I'm just thinking about doing that with broken ribs does not sound very delightful. I've had the wind knocked out of me before and I do not enjoy that process. Well, aside from that part, it was so much fun to do. It really was. Okay, let's stuff this thing. So you have All your right. bottom here. I have my handy dandy. Do you have one of these, Taylor? 
I don't. We're just working well, with the plate today. Well, we need today. to get you one. You've got to get... Will you get him one of these? I got him the uh, flat top, so we're making progress. I got to I gotta keep on the cooking things, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So we have that trough. So what we're going to do, and you can put it on a plate. I have a bunch of these cake rounds, and I always use those. And you're going to plop a little bit of that filling all the way around. You could use a big tablespoon to do this. It doesn't matter. And so you're going to use just enough to fill it because you want enough to also ice the outside, but you should have plenty. I'm going to use an offset spatula. You see how it's, but you can use a back of a teaspoon. You can use a butter knife, a jam, knife. it doesn't matter. And then just flatten it out a little bit evenly around. And don't worry, some of it falls in the middle that you can go around that makes it even yummier. And don't worry about the outside because we're going to go back and ice the outside. So you can hang over the outside. And that's anytime you're icing a cake, don't worry about the outside falling over because you're going to use that frosting for the outside. This filling is the filling and the frosting for this cake, which also makes it nice. All right. That is great. I love only having to make one thing. Right. One thing. Okay. So when that's ready, then take your next part, trough side up. If your cake has fallen in pieces, that's okay. Stick the pieces in place and that filling is going to hold it together. So it's okay. And then you're going to do the same thing. Plop a little bit of filling. And you see, I'm putting the filling not all right next to each other because I'm going to spread it out. And this is the last layer that we're doing a filling in. And the, once we put the top on, we're going to frost the whole thing. All right. So you see, I've got pretty generous and I'm gonna smoosh that around as evenly as possible. Again, not worrying about it, sticking over the side. Doesn't have to be pretty. Now you guys, if you don't like coconut, you don't have to put coconut on it, okay? You could even do chopped almonds on some of it. You can do or just leave it plain, it doesn't matter. But if you are using coconut like I am, it actually covers a lot of floss. You know, like if you didn't do it perfectly iced and it, you won't even know once you put the coconut on. All right, so when that's done, you just put your top. Now see, look, mine broke apart. I don't care because nobody is going to see it, see? And then again, put your frosting on top. And remember, you're gonna use some of it for the sides. See how easy that is? Anybody can make this cake, even if you're not great at baking. It's a great Yeah, cake when you cake. hear a multi-layered cake, you think it's going to be a lot more complicated than this. Right. You think, oh, geez, I can't make that. I don't know how to do that. But you really can do it. And that's one thing on my YouTube channel. Like, if you go to my YouTube or my Instagram, what you'll see, uh, Gene and I especially are known for really elaborate cakes. Like, we have motors in them and lights in them and multi-tiers and stuff. But... I like to show people things that you can make at home that you're going to make. I don't want you to just watch and go, that's really cool. I want you to say, you know what? I think I can do that too. And that's really what my YouTube channel is, is, is that it's bringing things that you can cook or bake uh, that anybody can do without fancy equipment. Now, if only you could do that for trapeze work. Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> but my students are learning that the most important thing is being strong, you know, getting, being ready. It's not just about fancy tricks because I always tell them it's not what you do, it's how you look doing it. And that's just like a cake. It doesn't matter what we do. The end product looks good. It tastes good. That's the main thing. And so we're just taking this same thing and going around the outside. That's it. That's it. And then if you're not putting coconut, make it look as pretty as possible. I'm going to coconut it so I won't even work that hard. And then I'm going to take, I always have pastry bags, but if you don't, you can use a gallon Ziploc if you want. It doesn't matter. And I have a 1M tip, which is an open star tip, but you can just snip the corner of a gallon Ziploc and just do, it, uh, it'll be around. And I like to, when I'm filling a pastry bag, I'll put it in something like a, a a vessel like this and that way it frees up both hands so that I can fill my pastry bag without trying to hold on to it with one hand and fill it with the other and I'm going to put all this in here 
and I'm gonna use that to decorate because I like this leftover. You guys don't have to, if you wanna use all of it to decorate and make it look pretty, it's totally up to you. This cake, you because it's key lime and cheesecake, it lends itself to any kind of berry, any kind of fruit to decorate. Today I'm using limes and strawberries, but kiwis are nice. If you slice a kiwi fruit, any kind of citrus looks good, any kind of berry, uh, cherries with the stem. Just make sure you tell somebody that it still has a pit if you haven't pitted it, but those look really pretty. Mandarin oranges look pretty. And you see, I have my pastry bag and it's ready to go. So you're a little ahead of me. I will wait for you. Because I my uh, frosting skills leave a lot to be desired. This is... <laughs> okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to show how I put coconut on it. Yeah, that's perfect. Go for it. So I made coconut, and because we're doing Tinkerbell today, I made pink coconut, okay? So all I did was I used a pink food gel that you can get anywhere at Walmart. It's, it's a food coloring, the gel one, not the squeeze liquidy stuff, okay? And I used just a little bit. I put it in a Ziploc, and I kept rubbing the coconut together through the Ziploc, and that distributed that gel so that I could have pink coconut, okay? And what I do for coconut, I'm going to move that out of the way so that you can see it. So I have the coconut in a bowl, and then I'll pick it up in my hand like this, and I will just press it lightly like this. Okay? Don't worry about that excess. We're going to go back and knock it off. So I pick it up, I press it from the bottom to the top, and just a very light press. Okay? And then when I'm done, I'll go back around and knock all the excess off. I kind of like the pink. I've never done pink, but then she said we were doing Tinkerbell. I said, oh, I got to do pink. It is very cute. I really like it. I think it looks very good, too. So I'll use my thumb. I'll drag my thumb around. If I see spots that I think need more coconut, I can fill them in. Actually, coconut and key lime go really well together. And then the top, I'm just going to sprinkle on. That's it. Just a little bit on top. You don't want it too thick because you don't want to overdo everything. Everything in cooking is a balance of flavors. Yeah, that's it. This makes a really nice birthday cake for people. It's a great cake to bring over to neighbors or to a potluck. We're bringing it to book club. There you go. That's even better. It travels really well. And because, especially when you put coconut, the coconut keeps it, if you keep it chilled until the last possible minute and then take it out, you can actually wrap it with plastic wrap and that will keep it all together. So I'm gonna put that over here. I'll get rid of that. Golly geez, I made a mess, I always do. You and me both. This is what we are currently at so that you can see on our end. But we're definitely at a mess for sure. That's okay, it's gonna taste good. And then since I have leftover filling, I put it in suit and I'm just gonna make little dollops so that I can use that to decorate. And I always like an odd number. So I'm doing five. You can do whatever you want, it's your cake. And you see, I've taken strawberries and limes today. I've cut them in half and I like to leave the stems on the strawberry because I like the green look of it. And then you just do whatever you want. I'm gonna probably stick a slice here and a strawberry like that. I like the way that looks. And I even have some of these little gold. Uh, you can get these also, Walmart, Kmart, Michaels, Joann's. I've got gold and silver, and I'll take those and I'll just sprinkle a little bit because I think that looks like Tinkerbell's pixie dust. And you know what we use for Tinkerbell's pixie dust when I started? We would have sequins. They would give us these silver sequins in a bag and we would have a little bag in our costume. And as we flew out, we held our little um, Tinkerbell wand that lit up with one hand. And then we would pull out the sequins and sprinkle them so you could see them, it would catch a light. The problem was that it started getting in people's faces and eyes. So they said, okay, we gotta stop. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see, I never actually knew that they had attempted pixie dust. I, like, all I can think of is myself, like from when, I I'm there at the uh, parks and like the fireworks maybe have like a windy day and you're getting the fireworks suit and everything in your face. Yeah. Um, on your end with the 
costume itself, speaking of like pixie dust and everything, is the costume, is it pretty heavy? Yeah, it is actually. In fact, you have somebody, or I did, I'm sure they still do, helped you get dressed. And then that huge wig also. So you had someone that did your wig and someone that helped you get into the costume. As a matter of fact, I have the original Tinkerbell Mara that was on my costume um, garment bag that my costume, because we had our own costumes. And this one was, was mine. So when I left, my crew cut this off the garment bag to give to me. And That's I just, neat. isn't that cool? Can you see it? I love it. That's so cool. Yeah. And I carried that all over the world with me since then. That is so awesome. So you, we talked a little bit about um, you and Michelle Smith. So Michelle went first on the third and then you went on the fourth. Did you guys decide, was it like a coin toss on who gets to go first or how did you pick who was going to be the first one going? You know, I don't think so. If I remember right, when I, I had to leave, I don't know, we didn't talk about that yet. Uh, T, um, Circus World was not happy about me doing Tinkerbell. They, even though my contract clearly stipulated that my trapeze act, blah, 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 within so many months, I was not in violation of it at all. In fact, Circus World closed early. I think they close at five o'clock every day. Um, and Tinkerbell flew at night, right? Mm -hmm. But they had a new um, general manager that had just come on. And he was from Major League Baseball. And he fancied himself some big uh, understanding of talent and athletes, which he clearly did not. And so he called me in and said, I, I understand you're doing Tinkerbell. And, you know, I know you're recuperating from the broken ribs. I was already working in the show again. I was doing the trampoline act. I was doing the trapeze act. Didn't cut any tricks. I was doing the exact same thing. But he said, you know, we really do not want you to do Tinkerbell at Disney World. We want you to rest and recuperate. And I said, and he said, you know, it was a big conflict of interest. I said, there's no conflict. I'm fulfilling, I'm not doing anything different. I'm fulfilling my contract here. And I go there and believe me, they make it so easy for me. They would drive me with a golf cart to the tunnel. I'd go up, I would climb up the ladder, I had a pair of shoes I put there, slid across, had another pair of shoes to put on, walked to another ladder, climbed down, got on the golf cart and they would bring me back. It was super simple. They took incredible care of me. Um, but he was just being difficult. You know, he wanted to show everybody that he was the big GM. And, and I don't even know how he knew I was doing it, to be honest with you, because it you couldn't see it. You know, when I did Tinkerbell, all the publicity that I did, you didn't know who I was. You saw Tinkerbell. You know, Disney's very careful about, I couldn't tell people I'm Tinkerbell. In fact, I didn't tell people I did Tinkerbell for probably 20 years. People didn't know I was the first Tinkerbell. I never said anything. Uh, because it's kind of the thing you don't tell people, you know, mm -hmm. and then my son saw people started posting about Tinkerbell and all that. And he happened to mention on Facebook one time, you know, that my mom was one of the first Tinkerbells. And so that was the first time that I even acknowledged outside my family and a few friends that I was the first Tinkerbell. Um, but anyway, so they were so difficult about it that Bill Sullivan himself came to Circus World. Bill told me the story. He goes, you know, I came with my hat in my hand to tell them that we will do whatever it takes to make it as easy for Mara as possible. And that it's not a conflict of interest. There's no problems. She's not exerting herself a lot, you know, other than that little bit of a ladder climb. And he goes, and we promised to take really good care of her, but it didn't matter. They were adamant about it. And he told me, he said, you know, if you insist on doing this, I'm gonna have to fire you. And I said, well, I'll save you the trouble. I'll quit. And so I did, I quit. And I ended up doing Tinkerbell that entire summer full time. They made me the full time I did Tinker. I flew, I think Wednesday through Sunday or something like that. And then Michelle did the other two days. And then I did the entire summer and I had contracts with the trapeze to go work. So, you know, Bill said, you know, you sure we'd love to keep you here forever. And I said, I'd love to stay forever, but I have contracts and I have to go. And so I just did it for that initial summer uh, I did all the publicity, all the television commercials that you saw of Tinkerbell was me because at night when they closed din uh, Disney down, that's when they shoot all the commercials. So they would sh uh, set up the cameras and they would say, okay, go ahead. And I would climb up and I would slide down and they say, you know, you want to rest? And I'm like, no, because that, those days they paid you 
um, I think it was like $140 every time you slid down the cable. So Just for those commercials, <laughs> like, Mara, you want to rest? No, 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 no. <laughs> Just it's just like the cash register, just cha ching, cha ching. Right, cha ching, cha ching, cha ching. Cha -ching. <laughs> and the poor crew, they would switch the crew out because they were getting tired because they had to climb up the ladder <laughs> with me. You know, they're like they couldn't keep up with me. It'd be like, da -da 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 -da. where's all the guys? <laughs> oh, but they were absolutely my crew. There was absolutely phenomenal. I I love them. I cried when I left there just because I didn't want to say goodbye to all the crew, my dressers. The, the guy that did my wig, they were so wonderful to me. And one of the funniest stories that, and one of my favorite stories is when they hired me and they said, you know, they took me on a tour and I had to do all this around working at Circus World initially until I, I left. And they said, would you like to see where we're going to your dressing room? And I said, yeah, of course. And I don't know if you know, but Walt Disney died before Disney World was finished, as you know. And where our dressing room was, was going to be his little condo. They were going to make him a separate apartment because he spent so much time there that they said, well, I'll have a separate apartment so he could, you know, sleep, take a shower, whatever. And then he passed away, unfortunately, before they even finished it and they never finished it. So they take me up in the elevator, which is Cinderella's castle goes to a certain point, And this is going to be your dressing room. And when they showed me, there was no... There was just drywall. There was no carpet. It was just cement on the floor. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I've been up in worse places. And <laughs> then I come back a few days later, and the, it was the most incredible dressing room you ever saw. There was carpet. There was makeup lights and mirrors. And there was even a separate room that had couches that if you wanted to come visit, like my husband was there all the time, my young son was there, they could sit there and they could pick up the phone and talk to me while I got dressed. It was incredible. And one of my crew members says, is there anything that you like to drink? And, you know, I just off the top of my head said, yeah, I like Coke. Every day there was an ice cold Coke on my dressing table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were that incredible. And it was really the people that I worked with that I loved. Bill Sullivan, I absolutely loved him to death. He was so wonderful, so respectful. And I have to say to this day, Disney World was one of my favorite, actually my favorite place to work that I ever worked in all the years that I worked in all the places that I worked, all the producers I worked for, it was my favorite place in the world that I ever worked because of the people that I worked with. Oh, and, and I mean, there's a reason that Bill Sullivan became a Disney legend. Like he is an incredible talent too. And I can, it's, it's amazing you say that too, because you, um, you ended up, you said going back on the road. So you, how long did you do Tinkerbell for? I just did it for that summer because I actually had contracts to go do the trapeze and our trampoline act and I had to leave. I mean, I would have stayed forever. I literally oh, loved it so much, you know, and, but I had, I was a circus performer and I had to, I had contracts and then I started working. And I never stopped working, you know. That's, I mean, that's not surprising thinking about, you know, flying across as fireworks are exploding around you. I mean, I don't think it gets much better than that, honestly. It doesn't. And another cool story that a lot of people don't know is underneath, a lot of people know this part, that underneath Disney World is an entire city underneath, which is where all wardrobe is, where people get dressed, where they take their breaks and so on. Okay. Well, no kid had been allowed down in there. And I told Bill Sullivan, my only contingency that would make or break me work in there was my son, who was three years old at the time, Mateo, my older son now, um, goes everywhere with me. I said, I am a circus performer. We're a family. Um, I don't work anywhere. I can't take my children. He said, well, you know, children aren't allowed. And I said, well, I'm sorry, then I can't do it. So they made a special accommodation for me. In fact, they made a special pass that I have. I couldn't find it. I was going to look for it. I found it the other day and now I can't find it that Mateo had his own little pass uh, to be able to come down with me. And that's something that's really cool. I'm, I don't know if they don't allow kids still, but at that time he was either the first kid or one of the first kids allowed there uh, as a special concession for me to do, dis, uh, to do Tinkerbell because I refused to do it. And the other funny story is July 4th, which was going to be the big debut of Tinkerbell. Okay, I get to the guard gate and I have my husband and my son with me 
And the guard won't let us in. He said, no children are allowed. I said, well, I understand that, but he has his own path. And well, I'm sorry, ma'am. There is no, no child is allowed past this point. And I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what, you get on the phone with Bill Sullivan and you let him know that Mara Christiani is here to do Tinkerbell with her son, but you won't let us through. So there won't be a Tinkerbell flight tonight. I said, I'll wait until you talk to him. So, he's like, <laughs> so this poor guard, you know, he's just doing his job. He gets on the phone and I, all I hear is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course, sir. Absolutely, sir. Right away, sir. And then <laughs> he hangs up the phone, he comes back, he goes, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, absolutely, the, the gate goes up. You have a great day. I said, you too. I said, I know you're just doing your job. Don't worry about it. And so we went through and, and we did the Tinkerbell flight. So there's a lot of cool stories like that. I have absolutely incredible memories, immense stories that nobody really knows about, you know, like shooting all night long for a commercial and Bill Sullivan and my husband would sit at the Crystal Palace because they let that on. Uh, they would make coffee for the workers. And Bill Sullivan and my husband would sit there and drink coffee and watch me go down. <laughs> back <and forth. laughs> There was a story about um, Mateo getting to write It's a Small World after park close while you were doing some training sessions. Um, I mean, that was just incredible. He talked about just writing it all night long, just on repeat. I'm sure that song is probably forever embedded in his mind now, <laughs> since it, you know, doing that all night as a small child. But that's so neat, just getting to write It's a Small World. Just Right. And he takes my grandson there, and that's still one of my son's and my grandson's favorite ride to go on. Oh, I'm sure. You write it enough on, on the loop, you know, you do the loop 10 times, it kind of, it forms a special place in your heart. Who doesn't and, like that ride? Right. We're going to, we actually, Taylor has finished decorating ours, so we are going to go ahead and show you what our non-coconut looked like so that you can see. Oh, oh wow. That's that's beautiful. We did a really good job decorating those sides there. But you can see why he becomes the cook. You no, you did a great job. I'd hire well, thank you, Mara. So I'm going to put this in the fridge until book club and Josiah can continue interviewing you and hearing all your great stories. Please let me know how they liked it. I will. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. He is a wonderful assistant chef. In fact, I'm going to eat, I see a little crumb there. I'm just going to take care of that little crumb so that it doesn't go to waste. Um, so I'd like to go back a little bit because Circus World is just like a parking lot now. And there's so many questions about Circus World. Um, there were a lot of celebrities who frequented Circus World over the years. Um, we have a photo. I sent this to you, so you saw this photo. I'll, I'll put it up for everyone. Um, it's a famous photo of Michael Jackson at Circus World. Um, did you ever see Michael or anyone exciting over there? No, I never really, I don't remember seeing any of the movies. No, I, you know, but I wasn't there that long because I worked a few weeks I think I was there maybe six or eight weeks of our, you know, of the time. And then I ended up leaving and going to do Tinkerbell full time. So I never saw anyone, but that picture that you sent are actually cousins of ours on my husband's side uh, through marriage. And that's the Bertini family. They're world famous for unicycle. And that's George and his sister, Monica. And we used to play beach volleyball here in Sarasota when we had time off. We'd all meet at the beach and play football. So I got a kick out of it when you show me that picture. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's George and Monica. But yeah, they're fabulous unicycle act. One of the best in the world. Oh, I'm sure. And um, so we're going to get to some more of the your family ties because I have there's a crazy family tie that we're going to get to in just a little bit that's just astonishing about i mean it's I, I believe you said it right the, the when we were talking that one way or another all circus performers are related and um, that it all tracks back so we're we'll be talking about another one and uh just a moment but what were some of your favorite i mean you weren't at circus world for super um, long but what were some of your favorite memories of Hayden city circus world probably meeting a lot of school kids because school kids used to come to the shows a lot of times uh they bust them in and I've mm -hmm. always loved meeting the kids. And I always made a point to go up and say hi to kids when I was working and there was kids there. Um, we used to love to swim there because the park closed, I think at five and you know, it's still hot in the summertime, it's still bright. So they used to have a dive show there and they had, I don't know if you remember the main building and there was like a moat around it that was full of water. 
So yeah. when the park closed, all the performers, we'd all go swimming. And my son swam really good. He was three years old, but he swam. He's already working in the trampoline act. And one time, way down at the other end where the dive show used to be, we would see something bobbing up and down. We didn't think much of it. And so I was swimming and swimming because I love to swim. And I get closer and I realize that there are snakes. It was full of water moccasins. So what did you do when you realized that the water moccasins were there? I screamed everybody, get out, get out. My husband had my son. He pulled him out right away. And so then they had to come and clear out the water moccasins. So we didn't swim in there anymore. But we used to have a lot of fun. In fact, speaking of food, that's one thing after the show because they were done so early. I had where they uh, parked our RVs was in the back part of the building. And so we had a pretty big piece of land. So I made a garden. I planted cucumbers and tomatoes and green peppers and all kinds of stuff. And then I harvested it and everybody would eat from my garden. And all the performers, the elephant trainers and everybody would eat out of my garden. And uh, so those were great memories. We'd all cook together and eat together. Um, and I would learn to do different dishes. You know, if there's somebody from Mexico, I learned to make salsa for them, uh, arepas for somebody from Brazil. And that's one reason why I cook so many different foods is from my friends in circus. Oh, I bet. Cause you have so many, I mean, circus performers around the world. That's, I mean, if you want to get, you want to get that kind of rare um, cuisine. I mean, it's who needs Epcot when you have circus performers around the world, you had your own little Epcot um, you're like, okay, I'm going to go, I'll go talk to the, uh, to the jugglers to get the uh, taste of Italy today. And everybody, believe it or not, most circus performers, at least one or two people in the family, if not more, love to cook. And like our entire family cooks, everyone, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that's really a rare gift to be able to learn to make actual authentic dishes from someone from that country and i would make a point and say hey let's get together and let's do a potluck and you bring something from your one of my favorite things is uh, i'm a vegetarian now but in those days i ate meat i still cook i do a lot of cooked stuff with meat uh but the <laughs> tiger trainer and he made he was from argentina and he'd made the most incredible steaks he'd do his own kind of chimichurri on them and and so i learned to make and i would make i make flan really good and he <laughs> loved my flan. So I would say, I'll make the flan, you make the steak. So that's what they do is everybody gets together and uh -huh. makes different things. And we we still do that. You know, we get together with our friends and family. If mm -hmm. you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see I cook with my cousins, Nick Melinda. And we cook together at his house. That's one of my, um, Bello is another cousin of ours. I don't know if you, the guy who's got the uh, orange hair that sticks up, Bello Knock. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also our cousin. We did a television show a cooking episode together here locally and so I try to get my friends and, and family together then COVID hit and mm -hmm. we couldn't do that so now I'm starting to get to be able to do cooking shows again with our friends and family and you'll see more and more of that. Getting into friends and family I got to get into the big one uh, of who you're related to which is crazy um, the second ever Disneyland flying Tinkerbell Mimi's or Beanie She's over on the West Coast at Disneyland. You later found out you're related to her. Yes, my husband's related. They're cousins. And Mimi Zerbini, they were actually doing a circus, as you know, at Disney World, uh, Disneyland at the time. And so mm -hmm. they were looking for a girl. And obviously, Mimi was an aerialist. So they said, would you do Tinkerbell for us? Now, the one in Disneyland, as you know, the castle's not nearly as high as the one at Disney World. So... Uh, she did that for years, actually, uh, mm -hmm. Mimi Zerbini. So I thought that was pretty cool, too. Yeah, and the, now at Disneyland, they, the launches, instead of being the castle, they do a lot with the um, the Matterhorn. There was a famous incident um, where Mimi almost had a really terrifying drop where they were, I mean, the rope snapped, and they were, like, holding on to her. I think um, there was a couple guys who were, like, just keeping her from the ground. Like, um, she'd gotten end up with a couple of scrapes, luckily, and not something catastrophic, but... Um, that was a very, very close call, very scary uh, moment. They nearly killed me. What are you talking about? I had the RNS on, and there was kind of a big clip, and the clip is on the wire, and then I just went. But when they, I had to jump over the motorhome about maybe two or three feet to drop me down on the wire, and uh, the snap, snap, before I know, I banged myself against the, the motorhome because it was a drop. You know, mm -hmm. 
And from that on, uh, somebody got me over, which I think is Hank, and then somebody was pulling him out. So by the time I got pulled in the thing, I got my face scratched, my arm scratched. It was bad. It was really bad. Uh, and really got scared. I guess everybody got scared up there because, you know, 200 some feet up in the air, you know, with that, that tiny, silly, little bitty, bitty, bitty rope. I was go. I was looking at down, and I said, "Oh, Mimi, you gonna join God real quick." <laughs> um, did you ever have any? Obviously, we kind of talked a little bit about that one where you're like, "I'm coming in fast." Did you ever have any scary moments? I mean, you're one of the first ones at Walt Disney World, so they didn't really have it quite perfected yet. Well, no, they they had a system in place that if we would slide and didn't make it all the way. They had paramedics with a ladder, uh, not paramedic, paramedic and fire rescue. Mm -hmm. That fire rescue had a ladder that they could, if they had to, come up and get us. I never had that. I did uh, one time slow down and they we had a, a rope system where they would have, we had a rope that they would tow you back in. But I think I only needed that maybe once. It was pretty good. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. had it down pat. They did have a thing where if lightning struck the cable, they had... Um, something that would monitor the lightning strikes on the cable. And if oh, they heard too many, they would replace the entire cable, which is extremely expensive. Uh, but mm -hmm. they didn't take any chances with safety. They were really, really on top of everything. That's great because, I mean, especially, I, I don't want to get on a cable that the lightning has been striking a couple of times. Oh, I felt so safe there. You know, I, I, they even had a redundant system. So you had a... Um, harness like I told you sort of like if you do a zip line if you've ever done mm -hmm. zip line but you just you didn't have just one cable attached we had two so that if one would break which is probably mm -hmm. never going to happen but there was a second one I mean they thought of everything they thought of every contingency um they were very safe I mean I've done a lot of crazy things in my career <laughs> I'm probably the safest I ever felt to be honest with you my husband's always had to stop me from doing crazy things because we have so many cousins it's like <laughs> One day, a helicopter and trapeze underneath, and his brother had to go to Japan at the last minute, so he called me, Mara, will you do the trapeze under the helicopter for the Fort Lauderdale um, air and sh uh, sea show? And I'm like, oh, of course, and then my husband finds out about it. No, you're not. <laughs> 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 no, you're not, Mara. So we argued about it. I didn't talk to him for about a month after that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I heard for you did you did talk about the one time it didn't make it all the um, that you didn't make it all the way across. What I heard that they do now, and I don't know if this was the case then, is they kind of just turn off the the pack of the lights so that they ideally you can't suit a ton of people can't see her, and they you just kind of drop a rope and they just pull you the rest of the way. Is that how it kind of worked for you then? Yes, that was the same system, and I think that they perfected the costume now that all lights up. Isn't mm -hmm. what we had, our lawn, I mean, our, our wand lit up. So mm -hmm. we would step out of the castle. And then as soon as they released us and we started sliding a little bit, then we would turn on the light. And then when we were almost just like three quarters of the way, a little bit shy of three quarters, we would turn our light off and slide the rest of the way in the darkness because then the fireworks works would take over. Um, mm -hmm. Then they went and I, they, changed the costume and lit the entire costume, which looks phenomenal. But that's not the one that original costume that we had did not do that. As far as like you mentioned the wand, is the wand attached to your arm or are you just holding it? Like is it is there a potential for Tinkerbell to accidentally drop the wand? You know, I don't remember. I think that our hand went through a loop and we held it. I think okay. I don't remember if it I don't ever remember worrying about dropping it. I do remember having the other hand that I remember I told you that they put the sequence in the pack that we would throw mm -hmm. and that was going to be the pixie dust because uh, they tried smaller stuff, but it wouldn't catch in the light because we're so high up. So they mm -hmm. actually had to use pretty big, it was about the size of a dime uh, sequence. Uh, but then, like I said, they started worrying about it falling into people's faces and then they discontinued doing that very quickly mm -hmm. after that. So again, going back to like all of the flying Tinkerbell performances and stuff, um, do you have any favorite mo memories of being flying Tinkerbell just through all that time? Yeah, actually I do because I remember I flew my mom and my father, stepfather in, uh, and my little brother. <clears throat> I think he was about 10 at the time. And they stayed at the, uh, at the Contemporary and looked, you know how the, the windows were the monorail? 
so that mm -hmm. they could see me uh, do Tinkerbell. And I remember that being so cool that my mom got such a kick out of, because she'd see me do all kinds of crazy things from, you know, ever since I was a little kid. And that was a really highlight was to be able to bring her from Kansas City to see me do Tinkerbell, you know, and they gave her the white glove treatment. And that was really cool. Oh, I bet. Well, it sounds like your whole family had the white glove treatment, getting to go you know, right into Small World, getting to go into Cinderella's castle. And I mean, it's things that to your family, like, oh, yeah, I just went inside Cinderella's castle. It's no big deal. But to everyone else, it's like, oh, my gosh, that's incredible. Like people would kill for getting that opportunity. I mean, that's awesome. Just absolutely. There's a reason Tinkerbell is the most magical of the Disney characters, because that's an incredibly magical experience for all of your family. You know that they took that, which was our dressing room at the time, and then they turned it into Cinderella suite where you can stay. Now people can book those rooms. That was our dressing room. They changed, that was our original dressing room. And then they turned it into now, the public can book those rooms. They turned them into Cinderella suites. So, but those were the original Tinkerbell dressing rooms. I don't know where they dress now, but those were the original ones. That's, uh, that's so neat. I wish I, I could know a little more on it now. I just will say this has been an incredible experience getting to dive into the history because for so many people, this is like the most secret Disney role. It's like, um, from what I've learned with, with from from other Flying Tinks is that, you know, it's, there's a, a a lot of it it's like we it's one of the most prestigious disney roles so it's uh, there's a lot of secrecy behind it so getting to kind of dive into a little bit of that and um you know live the magic i feel it's kind of i feel like we just got to uh, live one of the good old like 60s world of color episodes where walt disney is taking us on the tour and showing us the magic get that stuff off of me <laughs> if you're familiar with the story of peter pan you know that a little sprinkling of Tinkerbell's fairy dust can make you fly. Just getting to see how all of this incredible, I mean, it's a a 90 second experience probably, but it is just every time you're amazed as, as Tinkerbell makes her trek across. Right, um, and it's, it's a lifetime memory for a lot of people, including oh, people yeah. like me that were lucky enough to do Tinkerbell. But that's why what you do, Josiah, is so important and so cool because you bring all this information that people would never know. A lot of times when people find out that I was Tinkerbell and they start asking me questions, you know, and I've forgotten a lot of these stories until recently when people started asking, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember that, I remember that. And it really makes it so, and I think a lot of people are interested in what you're doing because it's that behind the scenes, you know, everybody knows things happen behind everything from movie sets, right, to anything, mm -hmm. but they don't know what those stories are and you bring that to them. And I want to thank you personally for doing that because I think it's a great, great thing that you're doing. Oh, I, I really appreciate that because it's I. I mean, I thrive. I. I it's because these are things that I wonder, and every time I have these, I have so many questions. I'm like, I just want to I have to find these people. <laughs> I have to get these answers, and it's so nice getting to share with everyone um, everything that we've got to talk about today. It's been wonderful. Now. I do also. We got to plug your channel, Mara Christie, oh, Annie, um, the Aerialist Chef. You have a special dish coming up here soon that you're going to be working on, and it is a flying Tinkerbell inspired dish. Yes, it's going to be Tinkerbell's pixie dust bumba, which is a baked Alaska with a secret in the middle. So if you check out soon in my um, Aerialist Chef, the Aerialist Chef on YouTube, I will be doing a show just for that. I am so excited to get to watch that episode because, I mean, she already told me what the secret surprise is in the center, and it's <laughs> incredible. I could not pull it off because, again, not a master chef. That's why I have the fiancé, but it's going to be delicious. So um, if you haven't already, be sure to um, subscribe to the Disney Record Guy YouTube channel and then head on over to Mara's YouTube channel. It's Mara Cristiani, the aerialist chef. It is an incredible channel. There's so many great recipes on there already. And I can't wait to um, have you guys trying some food prepared from one of Walt Disney World's first flying Tinkerbells. And I hope you all enjoyed what I imagine will be one of the only cooking segments that I do on my channel. But who knows? I mean, <laughs> our, <laughs> we're learning a lot. And apparently there's, um, you know, it's the resume starts with Disney and it ends in so many avenues and today it was a chef and I was it was delightful making that recipe or I should say making my fiance make that recipe for you but Mara I want to thank you again for taking the time it has been absolutely wonderful today 
It has been my pleasure. It's an honor. Thank you so much, Josiah. We all have the courage to fly.